What's up guys? So I know a lot of you have been asking about mastering your music and that kind of thing. And it's something that I've kind of held off talking too much about because it's something that I don't consider myself to be too knowledgeable about anyway. That being said is I did get the opportunity to have a look at the workflow and a bit of insight from a guy called Colin Bennon, who is pretty well renowned in the Cytron scene for mastering. He's definitely who I consider to be one of the top mastering engineers within Cytrons. So it was very interesting to get some insight and knowledge from him, specifically dealing with one of my tracks. So I'm able to apply, you know, his findings and stuff to my future mixes and that. That being said, is there's some pretty good insight here that I think you guys would probably benefit from quite a bit. Without blabbering too much, let's dive in and have a look at what he had to say. So just a quick warning, he's in the UK and I'm in South Africa, so we did connect uh, via the internet, so I got a, a kind of live feed of his uh, audio to my DAW. There was a couple of glitches and uh, mishaps in the connection uh, due to my internet connection, obviously. Um, so it might not be the best representation of audio. However, I'm going to post a little AB clip at the end for you guys so you can get a, an exact representation of kind of what was uh, going on in the audio path, at least. So yeah, let's dive in and have a look. Yeah, true. You know, it, 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 it's, a, it's about what works for you, and it's about gaining the insight. I can't emphasize this enough, and I'm always saying this on whatever production forum I'm, I'm, I'm writing on, is that you can't overemphasize the importance of gaining the experience. There is no other way to get good at this shit other than to do it and 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 never fucking stop. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, seeing the fact that you just listen to it and you're like, okay, the kick needs a bit of this. You listen to the bass, you were like, third harmonic needs to come down. And it was like these simple things, you know, like everybody, yeah. every producer in the world knows how to EQ at this frequency. But the fact that it made such a big difference in this example, I think is the takeaway, you know. First thing that I do is I, I check the gain of the track coming into my rig and that happens here, input levels and gain. Now I have this calibrated to uh, minus 18 dB full scale equals 0 VU and that's the standard calibration level for analog mo model plugins um, of which I use quite a lot as you'll see. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the loudest section of the track and just make sure that my peak levels are peaking at zero on the VU, and that looks good. It doesn't have to be absolutely precise, you know, up to a half, maybe even one dB either way is fine, but I like to I like to get it as close as I can, as quickly as I can. So the next thing to do is to listen to various sections of the track and look at the spectrum and see what needs doing in terms of frequency balance across the spectrum. I can already see this is pretty good. Uh, it doesn't need any high passing as far as I can tell. There's a little bit extra for my taste between 6k, 8k. That hi-hat's a little bit bright for me and I know people like that but if I'm just doing mastering without any reference track like this like here or uh, for I've been told just to, to do what I think is right then I'm, I'm, I quite often find myself putting slightly less top end in than, than some other people might. One way you can um, help yourself compensate for that is is if your monitors allow for it is by turning up the tweeters yeah then that'll naturally make all your mixes sound brighter and it'll encourage you to put less top end in your in yourself to get the same result yeah but you said you don't you don't have a treated room do you uh, no i don't have a no, treated so, room. so works isn't necessarily going to fix the problems that an untreated room will be giving you in terms of hard reflective surfaces emphasizing the top end um and I would definitely look into getting some, some, some treatment, some cheap stuff in there if you can. And I know obviously not every room is suitable for it. And many people like I do live in rented accommodation. I'm very lucky with my landlady. She's, she's cool with all this, but not everybody is. So I'm kind of listening and, and looking at what we've got. Now the question is to balance the top end. Do I want to put a dip in at about 7K or do I want to boost between 400 and 6k to cop to bring up the rest of the mid-range and i think i'm going to keep it simple and i'm just going to put a little bit of an eq dip in there and in the first instance well, what choices do we have ultra mean isn't going to be a good pensado is that going to go yeah we've got a 7k 7k high mid high frequency bell cut on this so let's 
take that down a little bit and see what that does. Try it with it all out. Mm, that's not doing what I want. I don't think that's uh, sharp enough. That's too broad and there's no cue on that. So I'm going to try it here instead. That's brought that open hat down a little bit more into proportion. Now I'm noticing there's a little bit of, seems to be a little bit of, of, of a little bit of a lack around 3K, 4K. So I'm gonna just see if that's consistent across the track because obviously any EQ that we add is gonna take effect on every sound, and I don't tend to like to automate during mastering, so. Yeah, so I'm going to try and push at uh, some high hats back. I think with this track is I, I was kind of um, I did decide to leave it a little bit open in the mid range because okay. I didn't want to give it too much of like that kind of full full energy. If you can notice, there's like more space, I guess you could say. But yeah, I guess at the and end that, of the day, the that's as well. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so I'll be careful with that and I won't add too much. No, but I mean, at the end of the day, like the reason I'm sending it to you is for your ultimate, you know, the, 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 you're making the end decision here, I guess. So if you feel for it's sure, too but little, it's then, important, yeah. It's important for me to take to take into account what your aims for the track were. I mean, that's almost, almost is more important than, than what I might think is, is right. As long as what we come up with satisfies my own definition of good sound, then I'm, it's, it's, it, this is your vision, this is your track, and it's making you happy, which is my aim here. Yeah. Okay, and amazing. myself. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> that's cool. that's, that, that can't, I can't see, that that's, that's got to be what it's all about, otherwise why am I doing this? Yeah. You know, that's the only reason to do this, is to improve music, and that includes, that means supporting the artist's vision, not, imp not imposing too much of my own on it. True, true. Okay, so I reckon we can have a little bit more body in this at around 400. So the best tool I have for this is this. This is just magic, this little thing. Just magic. Uh, checking my hardware analyzer, what's the top end doing? Can I get away with a little bit of 21k? Yes. The before and after on this EQA27, this just makes me smile every single time. Do you know what I mean? It just brings it alive. Okay, so the low, low end. You've got yeah, that, that one has kick. really, really pulled out like the sort of punch or the knock in the kick, which is kind of the vibe I really did want from, from this track. So Excellent. really doing a very good job. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad to hear yeah. it. I just love it. Very good. Acoustica, I can't, I can't, I can't praise them enough. So as far as the, the low end goes, you've got a tune kick by the looks of it. Um, high passing has been well done. It's nice and low, there's no DC. Um, okay, that's filtered out, that's no good. Um, okay, I would say in the mix, for my personal taste, 
I would have suggested bringing out the thump of the kick a little bit more over the low end, the low sub of the bass. In that, uh, what we're talking about, 50, 60 hertz region. Um, that's a personal taste thing here, and, you, and what you've got is definitely within spec. It's that there's certainly a little bit of rise in the in the kick on the RMS meter over the over the bass, and that's what I personally look for to, to, to drive a track along on the on the dance floor. You've got that low end of the kick just pushing you a little bit harder than the low end of the of the bass does. Um, but I would still like the subs to be a little bit louder. So can I do the pull section on that? See, there's not really much wrong around 200, so let's try it. Yeah. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a Pultec style boost at about 40 hertz and the corresponding Pultec style cut at 100. And what this should do, if I apply to both, it should give us a simultaneous low sub boost and a slight dip around 160, 200. Alright, so let's AB that. more extreme. Now we may be getting somewhere. I don't think we need any high passing on this at all, so I'm going to leave Pro-Q alone. And I'm just going to do a little bit of bass fatinage. Might need to bring this up again later on. We'll have to see how it goes. So that's the EQ done. I'm pretty happy with that overall spectrum. I don't want to get too deep into notching and stuff because stuff moves around and what you do in one notch might not best to use broad strokes if you can. I've been using Wave C1 in, um, with a modified Bass Enhancer 2 preset ever since, pretty much ever since I started doing mastering in 2005. And it's, I find it a really good way of um, just adding a little bit of subtle compression to the low end so that the the, the tail ends of, of, of kicks where, and bass notes where things fade out, it's just brought up a little bit more so that you get, you get the, the more of the, the, the body and length of the sound. Uh, and it can be quite, it's quite a subtle thing. And I also use this to balance the, the, the frequency range between 0 hertz and 120 with the rest of the track. It's kind of like a, it's kind of like a, a low shelf um, EQ as well. Okay, so this compressor is this is this uh, split? So you're only affecting the yes. low frequency. Okay, okay. Split band compressor. Yeah, so I'll t uh, yeah, so you've got split band compressor. The uh, the cut crossover is at 120 hertz, and it's as sharp as possible, which isn't very sharp on this. 
And uh, so you've got basically a split of a measure. But everything over 120 hertz isn't being touched. But everything below 20, 20, 120 hertz is being upwards, uh, upwards compressed. So that's peak reference mode. And I set this control so that the threshold is in between the kick and the bass levels, if I can. Here, they're, they're very even. But in general, I set the threshold so that it's the, the bass peaks below the threshold and the kick peaks above the threshold, so that it kind of pulls the kick down into the bass a little bit and then boosts everything together. I, I suddenly noticed the more presence in like the sort of low mids of the, of the bass elements. So I wanted to know exactly what you were looking for in that. Yeah, you, you're possibly hearing the effects of, of, of this at kind of like above 200 hertz because it's like it's, you still got the, the slope. It's not like a, it's not like a brick wall filter. Yeah, but also I guess it affects the upper harmonics the way you perceive them. You know, if the lows are thumping in the track, you're going to hear it. the bass is going to sound more present overall. I guess you know. Yeah, one of the, one of those was a master trick I, I, I read about, which which seems to bet to seems to to bear fruit in reality, which is if you want to emphasize a particular frequency range cut a little bit in the frequency range immediately below it yes okay that's interesting and that's that's kind of a, maybe it may be a similar thing to what's going on here because i'm reducing the the levels a little bit as well as compressing them just to get them into proportion for the next range of st next stage of the process which is the compression and then you noticed you said you noticed that the, the transient of the kick is a little bit too sharp for your liking yeah around around that six to eight k region is that something that you picked up um like looking on a meter or something like or do you just is that your ear just telling you okay this needs work it's a little bit of both i can see it on the meter and kind of that draws draws my attention to 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 actually pay to pay attention in that moment to, to that frequency range but i don't know if you can see it on on the skype shared metering and this you is a personal taste thing yeah. I used to be all into my full range kicks, you know, right up to 20k. Um, more recently, I, I've, I've gone back to, started to go back to kind of my way of doing it like I was like 10 years ago and, and, and more around the 1k to 5k range, my, my transient area. But uh, this is, this is, this, this, it's not that it's unacceptable, but I just noticed that the very top of end of it is a little bit out of proportion on, yes. um, to to the rest of it on on digicheck and i really trust digicheck really i really 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 trust digicheck so i would be inclined i can't really do this with dynamic eq now because there's too much other stuff in in the mix that would be affected by it yeah especially but, with the high frequencies it'll be quite apparent when there are those dips i guess yeah. yeah but if you were ever minded to do another version i would suggest perhaps putting a, a wide Quite, and that doesn't have to be too much, it's a couple of dB on this area here of the kick, just to bring that highest extent of the, of the, the click area down a little bit. But it, we can work with this. It'll, I think it'll sound okay in the mix, and it might even help it poke through a little bit more. You know, I, I might, my tastes, my personal tastes might not be the, the right thing for this. Well, I guess it goes back to that thing where, you know, we, we find a common ground, you know, between mix yes. and mastering. Yeah. Yes. You know, as long as, as long as, as long as you feel that your vision is being supported, and I feel that my vision of what constitutes good sound is being, you know, adhered to, then we can both be happy in this quite easily. Cool. So, so what would you do to to um, in this situation where there's kind of you feel there's a need to do something, but there's um, a, a barrier, you know, not being able to go back to the mix? Is there something that you would do to fix something like an EQ or? Would you just abandon okay. that idea? No. Well, what I would what I would first reach for in this instance is uh, my FLX4 tone boosters dynamic EQ, and I'll just show you briefly how this would work. And we may you may, you may end up working on this. Where is that kick click? Is that in the sides or is that purely in mid? Okay, there is no kick in sides. So that's good. So that means that the mind you, there's no hi hats in sides either. Okay. So whatever we do, we're going to step on the hi hats a little bit. But let's just see how that sounds. So that's about 8k. So this one, let's turn that into a into a bell shape and set up our extent. Okay. So that's set the, the bandwidth. Now let's just compress that. And we can see that the click of the kick is actually riding over the, everything else, which makes things a lot easier. We may actually be able to do this.
Let's just put that on the mid. No, actually, that's on the left because this whole thing is in mid side mode. Let's overdo it for a second. Yeah, I don't think I don't think this is going to be possible because the loudest thing in that frequency range is actually the hi hat, but. That means that they might still be internally consistent. So we could, yeah, we're already doing that a little bit here. Let's just do a little bit more. Yeah, I think we can get away with that. So what we've been working on here is the first half of my mastering chain, the EQ section. Okay, so this is the second half of my mastering chain. This is my compression section. Oh, so do I, you I, have I, two like di di different channels, like with whole strips? That okay, you've done this process. Now you move on to the next process, kind of. I so have you to have split it steps, up this way so, because okay. because my computer isn't capable of running everything all on one channel. Um, what I've got is I've got mastering chain start, mastering chain end, mastering chain start simply roots into mastering chain end, and I I, I just I can switch between the two with a keyboard shortcut to show me the plugins that are on each actual channel. Okay, interesting, interesting. So what, in, essentially, like once you've done um, um, the, the first... And I, actually, it actually helps me with, work, with workflow because it lets me split the, the process into, into kind of different logical sections. Yeah, no, that's exactly, that was actually going to be my next question is how do you know you've done, now <laughs> you're complete with step one and now you're moving on I don't know two. I'm complete with step one. Step one is done for now it's done it you know i'm okay with it for now when things get compressed it's not impossible for things to change especially in the low end because um as you'll see um two of the compressors that i use most um have little bass bumps and they they, they they do they do interesting things to the low end so i quite often find myself going back and forth between my compression section and my low end eq section to to so that, to adjust the low end level going into the eqs into into the compressors so that things don't get too boomy but you still get that lovely round fat warmth that they can provide so each section in my mastering chain has its own gain stage because EQ can obviously affect peak levels quite a lot and it's not uncommon for, for tracks that come in that have way too much low end um, to need that cutting out in the EQ section and then the level as a whole boosting up to reach that 0 VU equals minus 18 dB full scale um, calibration point. So what we're doing here is just adjusting that again, that'll be 1.7 I guess. Maybe it's going to get a little bit louder, it's not going to change too much. So it's a nice tidy looking mix. The dynamics are obviously very well controlled. So what, what are you looking to do with this plugin? Is it just a kind of compression and gain? Yeah, it's just it's just overall fattening and gluing. In mastering, I tend not to get too in depth with tweaking the attack times and and the setting of precise ratios, especially with a mix like this that's already well controlled. You don't need to, to drastically reduce the dynamic range because, I mean, what's... Often those little attack and release settings can widely throw off the sound of the, of the dynamics and you know especially in a full range frequency something a uh, track like side or something can make a big difference yeah absolutely and even without any compression i mean the limiter is only literally it's, it's, it's not doing anything right now it's literally there to catch everything anything over zero db but even without any limiting your dynamic range on this is like between eight and a half and and, and ten db and that's very little that's actually really squashed already in the mix 
So all I'm looking to do is is add a little bit of glue and, and, and a little bit of fatness and vibe. And, and this El Rey, it's, I just fucking love it. And I'll give you an AB as well. And I have this set up so that it's um, it's the fil- the side chain's filtering off at about about 100 hertz, which means that the lowest sub frequencies aren't really contributing that much to the gain reduction. That increases the glue factor, I find. We're not hearing the direct effect of that. It's not it's not like a high pass filter on the audio that we're hearing. It's a high pass filter on on the on, on the internal side chain that's feeding the threshold. Yeah. And many plugins have this. Many uh, compressors have this rather. Yeah. And if we turn that down, we'll get much more pumping because the, the little the, 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 the little things can sometimes make a huge difference. Um, I mean, like if we go back to this um, this one here, you know, we've got 2 dB on the top and, and, and 4 dB at, at, at 460. And that relatively subtle, broad sweep EQ, I think just makes a huge difference. Especially with the curves and you know on on that particular EQ. Okay, so the next thing with compression is the compounder. Now I can't actually show you this because it's hardware. And that's another layer of overall glue. I really, I mean, this isn't traditionally the compounder isn't traditionally a mastering processor, but uh, it's got this huge control. Uh, it's actually called huge, and it goes from flat to fat. Um, uh, and basically, it's a, it's a. I don't understand the the kind of like the electronic quite the electronic principles behind it, but it's an inductor based um, addition to the compressor circuit that lets some of the uncompressed low end through. And did you say you're using this in mid side mode? Yes, most of my mastering chain is in mid-side mode. I, I, I prefer what it does to the stereo image. Yes. And left-right compression. Okay, so the, the whole chain, so since the beginning, mastering start and mastering finish, both of those chains uh, were mid-side. And then you've got the decode at the end too. We've got uh, MSN code happens uh, here. Okay, I see. Okay, I missed that. Yeah. Before any of the EQ, but after the pre-process. And then the mid-side decode, mid-side decode happens just before the limiter. And there's only really one control settings on the compounder that makes any sense in the mastering context. So I tend to leave it where it is and, and just gain into it. And it looks like we're pretty good. got about 7 dB which is so that means we hopefully we should only ooh, yeah, should we only be taking a dB or two off in limiting so let's do that So there's something about the high bit, high bass in the kick that I'm I I don't really like. I'm wondering if I can get some EQ on that without damaging the bass too much. So for this, I'm going to use Pro-Q, and I think it's between 200 and 300 hertz. Oh, you can see that's that, that that's getting that octave plus the third on the on the bass line as well. It hasn't addressed the issue on the kick that I was looking for. But I think that's a good thing. I think this is a good thing anyway. On the bass line, that, that frequency is a little bit of a it's major third. And it's if you if your track's in a minor key, you can quite often get an improvement in clarity by taking that down, that harmon, 
have that third major third harmonic down a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes a massive difference. I, I didn't even realize like something so simple like I probably EQ'd the bass to smithereens and then in the mix like ended up probably bringing that back up again to fill the space. But crazy how something so simple just from somebody else's ears can can acknowledge like how much it's actually needed if that makes sense okay so let's get into final dynamic control because i think we're pretty much there in terms of spectrum and general squash so what's your aim with this track do you want it do you want it like properly properly smashed or do you want a decent bit of dynamic range in there or do you want lots of space well i think for me um i i most of the time I'm playing my own tracks rather than um, sending to Beatport for DJs to play. Um, and most of my music, I think, is uh, is listener enjoyment. So I think go for audio quality over loudness and smashing the threshold, if that makes sense. Okay. So don't overdo it if it doesn't need it, you know. Because uh, yeah. as you said, the dynamics are already pushing, um, pushing the limits earlier. Yeah. Uh, and let's, just, let's just have a quick look at that limiter, just to see how much... I mean, that, that was 10 dB boosters. Because, because I know my gain staging is, is, is good all the way through, I know pretty much that 10 dB is the kind of the ballpark. And here we go, here we go, like, minus 8 loss. Smack bang on it. Don't want to absolutely smash. So yeah, we, like I said, we're getting about three dB gain reduction on the limiter, which is which is very good. And normally, I'm with 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 limitless. I find I find that up to about six dB is is fairly transparent. So we're doing well there, definitely. And we shouldn't be seeing too much. Yeah. Um, and is that minus eight luffs? Is that um, a kind of solid number that you go for every time, or would you push it a bit harder if a, a client <laughs> said no, they want something that is smashed for for club uh, use or something? Yeah, like uh, well, I mean, clients it, it smashed for club use is, is kind of a little bit of a, an oxymoron because um, if you've got a track with dynamics, then uh, the club engineer, if you have a chat with them beforehand, and if you you know. If you can somehow convince the the club engineer that you know what you're talking about, and that he you can, can convince them to, to trust you that that your material is going to be have a more dynamic range than what you know the rest of them do. And this is more often, in my experience, possible with festival uh, or festival stages than than actual clubs. Yeah, absolutely. Then yeah. You can you can you can get you know you can arrange for a higher peak level, which will bring your average loudness up to a, the same level as someone who's playing purely like mega smashed masters, but you'll get the additional punch from the additional dynamic range on top of that. So actually getting more dynamic range into your masters and, and is can be a really good thing in terms of, of making your music stand out above other people's in terms of clarity and, and, and like, you know, wow, I can really feel that kick hit me in the chest rather than there's just this dull rumble from the combined kick and bass together. Yeah, I've always kind of felt that that because um, I I play mainly my own music that I've always been able to just push the master up a little bit, and it sounds more pleasing at least to me than something that's been smashed and limited, and then you know it's hitting the limiter in the mastering chain, and then hitting the limiter and in the in the festival system or the club system again, and that just reduces the overall kind of mm. dynamics, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So I guess in people, situations people, where people are playing producer sets and doing their own kind of tracks and stuff, then having a more dynamic master is definitely favourable, like you said. It can be, but you you need to you need to be absolutely sure that that you're not going to have any surprises later on in the set that are going to mean that all your good work with that dynamic range and careful, careful mastering is going to be undone by something that sticks out True. much further than it should do and takes people's heads off or you know, kicks the the system limiter in harder than you really want. Uh, uh, minus eight luffs should be fine. And this is what we were talking about just now. 
it's, 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 a good, it's a good ballpark compromise between dynamic range and loudness um, for Psytrance. You never want to trust one meter above others, in term, especially in terms of loudness, because um, they'll, give you, they'll give you different readings from the same material, uh, because they all look at things in a slightly different way. And I find that the, the, if, you look at, if you look at lots and if you, you figure out, you don't necessarily need to figure out exactly what each of them is doing, but you can figure out from what each of them is telling you what's going on in maybe a more detailed way than you would do if you're only looking at, at that one perspective of one loudness meter. So we've got the Luffs meter and we've got the dynamic range here and they're both showing us different rate, different readings and we've also got the, uh, the RMS readings on the DigiCheck over here and between them all I get a, I get a good example. I get a good uh, idea of of um, what the loudness is doing, especially between the low end and the rest of the uh, rest, the rest of the spectrum. And what we've got here with with about minus five and about five and a half dB of dynamic range on on the TT meter, and about eight dB luffs eight, eight luffs on the on limitless. This is a this is a good compromise for me in terms of loudness and and dynamic range. Yeah, I mean, eight, eight. Uh, many people would consider already at minus eight dB to be like, "Whoa, what the fuck are you doing?" You know. But for for this kind of music, I find personally that this works, and 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 no one's yet come to back to me and said, "God uh, fuck's sake, Colin, what have you done to it?" Yeah, yeah. But I think also a key thing that you said is um, that you must never trust one meter, and that you kind of go, you've got those three the. RME DigiCheck, the Limitless, and the TT Dynamic Range Meter, and you use those three, the RMS, the Dynamic Range, and the LUFS to kind of give you a, a slightly more accurate representation of the metering, because... I'd like to think it's more accurate. I know, I, I feel like it tells me more <laughs> if, I, if I look at all of them. That's, yeah. that's, that, that's how I feel, but, you know... I, but I think no, the, no the takeaway from it is that if, if you just read one meter and think that that's going to give you exactly the right number, especially with something like RMS or LUFS, which is very much, a, I think it's an average of audio over time, so yeah, it's all the algorithms are going to be slightly different, so knowing the meter I, I, yeah. and trusting a bunch yeah. of different ones, I think, is the best takeaway from that. This is what I find works for me. Hmm. Um, none of this, I don't know, I mean, like, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm self-taught over the last 15, 20 years in terms of mastering, and I'm, I'm well aware that the aspects of what I do might not be industry standard or, quote, unquote, the way you're supposed to do it, but it works for me. But in the end, there are, you know, if you've got 10 producers or 10 mastering engineers in a room, uh, talking about the best way to do things, you'll end up with 12 best ways of doing things. Yeah, true. You know, it, 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 it's, a, it's about what works for you, and it's about gaining the... I can't emphasize this enough, and I'm always saying this on whatever production forum I'm, I'm, I'm writing on, is that you can't overemphasize the importance of gaining the experience. There is no other way to get good at this shit other than to do it and do it and do it and do it and do it and, do it and never fucking stop. No, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, seeing the fact that you just listen to it and you're like, okay, the kick needs a bit of this. You listen to the bass, you were like, third harmonic needs to come down. And it was like these simple things, you know, like everybody, yeah. every producer in the world knows how to EQ at this frequency. But the fact that it made such a big difference in this example, I think is the takeaway, you know. My philosophy with production in general is that a track is made up of a million individual, timely, individually insignificant details. The precise cutoff frequency of the high pass on the hi hat, the precise level of the 6.3k compared to the 8k on that hi hat. All of these things, like individually, you you know, you you play a mix with with one of those details different, you won't notice it necessarily. But you play a mix without any of those details taken care of compared to the mix with all of those details taken care of. And that's your track. A track is made of a million different individual tiny details. And if you can get every single one of those right, then the, the overall quality of your track will be improved. No detail is too insignificant to try and pay attention to. And the combination of all of those details is what you're looking for. So the same as with mastering. Um, it's, it's, it's a slightly different approach because most of those details have already been taken care of, hopefully, in the mix, and you're relatively limited to what you can do. 
But being able to pay attention to all of those details and to honestly listen to them and to try your best, and it's an imperfect science, but not to fool yourself into hearing things that you're not hearing. It's the same set of skills, but just applied in a very slightly different way in a different way I think between production and mastering but it's all in the details all we're hearing is details combining together to make one hopefully cohesive piece of music pay attention to the details and and the track takes care of itself and I think seeing you know for me seeing you um, find these details um, it's uh, probably make my mixes better in the future because now I know I'm probably going to have a bit of a, a, a uh, accentuated like low mid uh, third harmonic kind of frequency um, as well as a bit of an accentuated like high range on the kick because looking at you the the way you looked like analyzed it, it was like the first things that you almost picked out so seeing somebody work uh, you know getting another perspective um, and how quickly they were able to pick up like those little those little details as you said um, it made for everything to kind of just come together a little bit better, I think. Because this, because what the detail, a detail like this, like this 260 hertz cut here, can obscure so much in its neighbouring frequency area. If it's, if it's, I mean, it wasn't too bad in this case, but if that frequency had been too loud, then that would be the most prominent thing that we'd our ear would be drawn to in that area, and lots of other things would be overshadowed by it. But if you just take that out, then or you know, attenuate it to a, you know roughly the right kind of degree, and so much else becomes clear because our attention isn't being drawn to that one thing anymore. That's amazing, and I think also you know um, you know when I'm writing the track, when I'm producing the track, there's a vision that I have, and maybe it could be like a, a bias or something that I've kind of imprinted on the track. And often you need somebody's perspective to just be like, no, no, this just needs to be a little bit softer. Come on now, you know. And then, you know, sometimes it does make a huge difference. Yeah, but don't be afraid of putting, of, of doing what you feel in the track in terms of those frequency biases, because that's part of, of the character of your productions. That's part of your voice as a producer. And that's that's important for me as a mastering engineer to try and preserve and enhance and, and, and to, to try and flatter, because in the end, that's going to what, that your own individual voice as a producer and a writer is going to what, be what make, makes your track stand out amongst other pieces it's going to be what makes your tracks recognizable as being you and i think that's vital for anyone trying to make a name for themselves anyone can can download the latest hypnoacoustics you know um kind of stem mix and and, and oh that's a good kick i'll use that with that bass because that's that works really well together but that's not your voice so much and yes sure you can process that a little bit but if someone's already made the ultimate kick and bass for their tastes then any subsequent processing of that is only really going to take it away from that a little bit. And if you can find your own voice as a sound designer and as a programmer and as a writer and put these little biases and 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 uh, little little quirks and, and little maybe you might even think they're mistakes but if you keep making them that's your voice and that you can make it you can make those work if you're if you do it with conviction. And if you try and make sure that that that, that your voice lasts through the production process into the mastering process by, by using good communication with, with whoever you, you, you're using as a mastering engineer, then I think personally it can really help your music as a whole. Don't be afraid of, of sounding different. Just be afraid of sounding bad. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. I think it's interesting because a lot of the time with a lot of the other mastering engineers, um, they'll say... Uh, you know, they'll take, they'll send the mix back and say, do this, do that, do this, do that. And often it'll end up, to, it'll come to the point where it kind of, the track doesn't feel like it's yours anymore. Mm. Or it sounds very different to what you originally had. It's, it kind of takes away that passion that you had for it. Yeah. To, in a sense. Absolutely. Like, so I've always felt like, you know, doing something, uh, uh, you know, taking it back and having to recreate the track kind of takes away the momentum of that kind of creative energy. But I think seeing the little things make such a big difference kind of it, it flipped the whole process on its head for me at least <laughs> right yeah well i mean going back to what you were, what you were just saying about um you know having to re redo a, a master a mix for the mastering engineer with the changes that they suggest i mean i quite often do that but i always try and 
I, my first assumption is that what I'm being presented with as a mix is the result of an intentional set of creative choices by the artist intended to express something in particular for their own vision. And I'm, I, I, I'm very loath to, 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 I, I'd much rather try and make that vision work than, than go back and ask for a million and one changes. Although, you know, it, it does, it does frequently happen that that's necessary, but it can go too far. Yeah. But I think the fact that you, you, you wanted to work with what I had sent you first and try to, to fix it within what we both, you know, become mm. sort of meet halfway. I think that in itself creates a, I don't know, maybe it's a, a placebo because there's still that kind of momen momentum effect and I don't have to dig through yeah. the old, the old project, but I feel like it's, it's even just these small little changes, like just a being it quickly. Mm. It's, Sounds and, like but the, the, the revision process can go too far. I mean, my housemate is uh, an old old school Psytrance, Goa trance producer who kind of left it alone for quite a while. And then up until a couple of years ago, he made a, you know, he, he was writing Psytrance again and he released three or four albums. And he's actually released uh, recently on a, on a very well-known old school um, label that's, that started up again, a, a, a track. But... The mastering engineer who worked on that um, asked for the stems of the tr of, of the track so that it, uh, the so that they could change the kick and bass the the, the, the kick and the kick vibe on the, on the tune basically it wasn't wasn't to the mastering engineer's taste and and my housemate was was reluctant to do it but in order to get the release you know he sent the stems off and what came back was something that was he he's told me it was, it was a long way away from his vision of the track if I ever do that fucking shoot me because you know this is this is not what mastering is about. It's about supporting the artist's vision. Yes, it's about making that vision sound good, but there's 101 ways of doing that. And having said that, I know I, I will I will ask people to, to make changes if there's stuff that really does need doing. But my first impulse is to try and work with what I'm sent because, like I say, that's the vision. So back to this track. Um, I'm yes. pretty happy with the way this sounds. Would you like to comment on anything that you've heard? Awesome. That's pretty much it. I hope you guys enjoyed that. So like I said, I'm going to be posting some AB clips for you guys to compare the kind of before and after um, of the kind of sound differences of, you know, what he actually did. I'm going to level match them. So I'm going to bring the level of the master down as well as the level of the unmastered up just so you can get a more accurate representation of exactly what's going on in the audio. But that being said, let's have a listen. The universe is like a machine.